Welcome. Everything is fine. You are listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 1, Episode 7, The Eternal Shriek. Woohoo! It was written by Megan Amram. She worked on Parks and Rec as a writer and story editor. And it was directed by Trent O'Donnell. And he's directed several episodes of New Girl. This episode aired October 20th, 2016. So let's get into it. Michael announces his retirement, citing all the examples of how his presence ruined the neighborhood. Chidi is upset, but Eleanor believes this is the best case scenario. So we're starting off right at the end of the the last episode. No time has passed. No time has passed. Did you like all the examples that Michael was giving? Yeah, he seemed to be coming up with some great examples. He underestimated the amount of shrimp that people would eat. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. giant shrimp. I love that little look from Tahani, like, oh, yes, you did. You, you really did. did. Mm-hmm. And you really screwed the pooch on that one. <laughs> and how I tried to get Jianyu to open up, and then a sinkhole opened up. Yeah. It's perfect. He's really, he's really created his own narrative mm-hmm. as far as how he's the problem here. He's really interpreting it very selfishly, almost. Hmm. Like he's, or self-centered. Yes. Yes. He's the problem, and everything is his fault. Yes. He's really getting down on himself. Hmm. I think so, too. So, right off the bat in this episode, who do you side with? Do you feel like Chidi is unreasonable to be upset? Or do you think that Eleanor has a good point that, you know, yay, now we've got a solution to all of our problems. He's going to get to ride rainbow waves and smoke cigars or something like that i don't know what eleanor says exactly but smoking moonbeams or yeah yeah. smoking moonbeam cigars or something sure and uh (laughs) that's what she says and i love it and she just thinks that this is kind of the best solution like she gets to be happy he gets to be happy there's no problem right yeah i totally agree you agree with eleanor i do okay because and as far as she knows, this is going to be perfect for Michael. He gets to retire and she gets to stay in the good place. Mm-hmm. So you're not all at all convinced when Chidi says that none of that makes up for all the lying and pain and suffering that Michael has endured at the, to, up to this point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're totally Eleanor. <laughs> and I'm like right in the middle, I think. Yeah. I think that so I you're would being just... like Chidi right now. You're indecisive. Yeah, exactly. I'm totally indecisive. At this point, I'm thinking there's no way it's going to turn out this great. It's way too and, easy. Yeah, it's, it's way too easy. And there's no way it's going to be that easy. But at the same time, Michael's only leaving because he thinks it's his problem. Like, mm-hmm. how happy can he really be? And we already know that he loves being around humans, that he wanted to be here so... Even though he's leaving and he might be happy in this retirement. He really wants to stay. He does. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I'm more with Chidi then. I don't know. I just, like, talked myself onto his side. That's totally fair. Mm Mm-hmm. So we get our first flashback at this point in the episode. And I was thinking we could just talk about the entire story of the flashbacks all at once instead of just doing them individually. Sure. Yeah, it seems to make sense. The flashbacks are all very connected. Okay. So you want to tell us what happens? All right. So, Chidi lies to his colleague by telling him that he likes his red cowboy boots. He agonizes over the lie, and his girlfriend tells him to be honest. When he tries, his colleague gifts him with his own pair of red cowboy boots. Mm Diamond-studded red cowboy boots. Yes. After his colleague nearly dies, Chidi is finally able to say that he hates the boots. Three years later. Yeah, three years later. After this guy had, like, a near-death experience, that's what it took for Chidi to finally just be honest. Mm -hmm. So do those boots remind you of any other television show? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was not a subtle reference. Not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. If you guys have seen How I Met Your Mother, you know that that guy is not pulling them off. Not even close. (laughs) Ted could totally pull those off, though. Ted could totally pull those off. Totally. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think of the flashbacks in this episode? I tend to agree with one of our listeners. Okay. 
Ben says that these flashbacks are borderline ridiculous. Yeah. He says that they were unrealistic. Unrealistic. They go too far and become outrageous. Good word for this. Okay. I don't buy the situation because it just keeps getting more and more ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that would ever happen. So you don't think that Chidi would ever lie about it? Or you don't think that... Oh, I think Chidi would definitely lie about it. But then his colleague buys him his own pair of boots. So they can be boot brothers. And Chidi still can't say anything. So would you find it more believable? he's in the hospital and he still can't say anything. It's just... It just keeps escalating to a comedic climax. Okay. I don't like it. <laughs> you don't like it. All I don't right. like it. Just because we know exactly where it's going. It's you predictable that... for me. We know that it's just going to keep getting more and more ridiculous until finally he snaps and he tells them the truth. Not as predictable as I thought, though. Because when I thought, okay. I thought in the finale of the flashbacks, he would finally tell them how he felt about the boots mm-hmm. and he's so excited and proud. And then his colleague would like clutch his heart or something and then die. Oh, okay. So Chidi would be indirectly responsible for his colleague's death. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the flashbacks? I don't mind them. They are definitely over the top, but I don't think it's so much the situation. Like, I don't think it's that that over the top that someone might gift you something that you don't like when mm-hmm. you said you liked something of theirs. I've had that happened before to me usually it's with something i actually like and then my friend or my family member might give me the exact same thing saying oh you said you liked mine so i thought i'd give you one so it doesn't seem like that situation would never happen but then for chidi to have waited like three years to tell this guy is the part i think that is the most unrealistic here i feel like it would be brought up like Oh, Chidi, you're not wearing your boots. Or why aren't you wearing those boots I bought for you? Do you think that Chidi went around wearing those boots just so he could keep up the lie? That seems like something that Chidi would do. Maybe that's why we don't hear about this girlfriend later. <laughs> because of the boots. <laughs> because of that the boots. That was a boot breakup? Maybe. Wow, okay. Also, him waking her up in the middle of the night to complain about this ethical quagmire he's gotten himself hey, into. that's what... You know, relationship is all about having a shoulder or somebody to discuss your your problems with. I'm pretty sure that you would hit me with a pillow if I woke you up every night. If you did it every night, yes. (laughs) Absolutely. One night, you get a gimme. That's it. Just one time, though. But if you ever wore boots like that, you would know my opinion on them. Oh, yeah. Because you shouldn't let people you care about walk around looking like that. Yeah, okay, yeah. (laughs) But you can see how happy they make him, right? Yes. Like, Chidi's colleague, his friend, he seems positively ecstatic about his new boots. Like, he really loves them. So, in that case, I don't know. I feel like I might just let it go. I'm sure he could think of a million ways to get out of wearing the boots and still show how much he thinks those boots look great. Yeah, and he could really just focus on how the boots make his friend happy. Mm -hmm. And they seem to really increase his confidence, maybe. Like, he doesn't have to focus at all on the actual appearance. They really bring out your personality. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't have to actually talk about the boots themselves. But it's not something that's that easy to think of, I think, when you're put on the spot. Mm -hmm. And the guy says to him, do you like them? tell the truth and he says they're the best boots i've ever seen yeah yeah so what do you think the flashbacks are trying to show us i think they're trying to show us where chidi stands morally as far as lying goes conflicted no completely in the situation where eleanor is in he i think because when you're studying something like ethics and your whole life is kind of about that yeah if you do something unethical in your mind then it's like wait a minute it it kind of throws you i Mm -hmm. think 
Um, like I teach this every day. I should know how to deal with this, but then suddenly when it's happening to you, you don't. Yeah. And it might be showing him how certain moral theories are not that applicable to the real world. It depends on context. Yeah. And I think that's just kind of messing with his head at mm -hmm. the moment, really. Right. And I think that the flashbacks are showing us that Chidi agrees with Immanuel Kant's view of ethics. You know, that lying is never okay. That is never moral to lie. Right. But that he has difficulty actually putting that into practice. When thrown in a situation where... He could offend somebody. <laughs> it's so painful, though. Really? I don't know. Like, I get it. And Just the funny tell thing the is... man how you feel. Holy moly, it's not hard. Okay. I have a very recent example with just you and I. Okay. That I will uh, tell our listeners about. Maybe this will illuminate uh, why we think differently. But for Jason's birthday... Oh, okay. I know what we're getting at. His mother got him a turntable? Yeah. Is that what that's called? Okay. For records. And it was not a gift that he wanted. So he immediately told her that I don't want this. In my mind, I was having like a full on freak out because... She told me later that she was super uncomfortable. It's like the most uncomfortable she's ever been. Um. Oh, wait. This is you talking about me? Not about your mom? Yeah, you said you were the most, in this situation, you were the most uncomfortable you've ever been. Oh, yeah. I was very uncomfortable because I've always been brought up to just say thank you when I get a gift, regardless of whether or not I like it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in your mind, you were just being honest with your mom that this was not a gift that you wanted, that you wouldn't get any use out of it, and that you felt like the money could be put to better better things. Right. And both of those views are totally legitimate. Like, you can't really criticize either of them, I guess. Well, they're, yeah, they're just, they're both legitimate. I think it's being dishonest by accepting a gift that you're not going to use and not telling the person because mm -hmm. you're essentially lying to them like, oh, I'm totally going to use this, but then you're never going to use it. That yeah. to me is lying. Okay. So you would probably... You would be that side of Chidi in this example. You would be the side that's saying, I shouldn't be lying to him and I should just tell him the truth. Right. Whereas I'm over here saying, oh, well, to keep that person's <laughs> feelings from being hurt, mm -hmm. to make them feel good about themselves and about their choices, I will lie. I will take that, that hit. If the roles were reversed, mm -hmm. if you were the gift giver... Okay. And you find out six months later or however long later that this person never used their gift. It's sitting there collecting dust. Would you be upset that this person didn't tell you that they would never use it or that you could have got them something that they would actually appreciate? Hmm. Because I, personally, I would be disappointed. I'd be very frustrated. I'd be like, well, I wish you told me that you weren't going to use it because I could have either purchased you something else with the money or i could have used it myself or i could do something else with it yeah that's true um and other people would say it's a gift the person can do whatever as soon as it's left your hands they can do whatever they want with it because it's essentially theirs yes so what does it matter what you do with it but i can't i don't agree with that because that again like i said it feels dishonest yeah, I think this enters into kind of a different category because we are talking about gifts. Right. But it's it's the same the same idea of trying to figure out where the line between honesty and social niceties mm -hmm. lie. Mm -hmm. And I think that Chidi's girlfriend gives him really good advice. She just says, you know, if that's really how you feel, then just be honest with him. And it probably would have been fine because even in the flashback that we do see, like he seems a bit bummed and he says, this is why everyone hates moral philosophy professors, but he doesn't, you know, clutch his heart and die. <laughs> right. And he doesn't start yelling at Chidi. He doesn't get irrationally upset. Yeah. 
He just sort of seems a bit bummed that Chidi was lying to him. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to bring up something that I thought of and then um and then our listener Alan brought this up in an email as well. Chidi's supposed to speak French. Yes. But in this flashback, we see him in Australia. At one point we get a sign of a Sydney General Hospital, so he's in Sydney, Australia. Okay. So it seems really unlikely that he would be speaking French in Australia and teaching at a university in Sydney if he didn't speak English at all. Right. So we can only assume that he's bilingual. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. In my mind, Chidi must speak English as a second language or and, and be fluent in English. That's kind of what I think of it. Personally, I don't think it's a huge inconsistency. It's a little bit odd when you're first watching it. Why is he in Australia? I think it might be brought up in the first episode when he says something like, I I traveled around to these places. Okay. But he does also bring up a different university in this episode, the Sorbonne Institute, I think, in France. Mm -hmm. And it's not at all the same university, but there's nothing... That says that he can't teach at a few different universities. Sure. So in my mind, he taught at the University of Sydney, if that is a university. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't look this up, guys. Um, and then he taught at a different university in France. That's very possible. Makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, as a teacher, you can go from different jobs and different places. Yep. So, and he has said that France has wonderful museums, so he's been there before. Right. So, it it makes sense. All of it makes sense to me, personally. Um, It's just interesting that we have the good place translating everybody's language when Chidi could likely just speak English to Eleanor. And he would be able to understand her speaking English to him. Right. I was thinking about that, and I feel like... They probably just would have you speak in whatever language you're most comfortable in. Mm. So he probably speaks French because that's his native language. Okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I do really like his friend, actually. I think he's really funny and really charming and sweet. Like a little puppy dog. I don't know. Yeah, he's great. He just has bad fashion sense. Oh, terrible fashion sense. But his humor is just, it just works for me. When he approaches Chidi and he's like, I read your article on logical positivism. So dry. (laughs) And it's a compliment. Yeah, (laughs) it's a compliment. And then later Chidi says to him, yes, I did sit in on your lecture today. It was so great. So bleak. (laughs) And they're both complimenting each other. That's their sense of humor. That's how their their camaraderie works. Mm -hmm. Something is dry and something is bleak. It's great. Nailed it. (laughs) Yeah, I just, I loved it. I thought it was great. And actually, a nice thing that I noticed in this episode when Chidi goes to his colleague's classroom, there's all kinds of stuff written on the chalkboards. Mm -hmm. And it so happens that this guy teaches eschatology, which is a branch of theology that deals with death, judgment, and the final destiny of mankind. Wow, how poignant. Yeah. So I was like, (laughs) wow, that's uh, that's relevant. (laughs) Because we've got uh, we've got death in this episode, we have judgment, and obviously the afterlife. We're dealing with that, mm-hmm. so that was cool. That was a nice little little Easter egg for people who were paying attention and who knew, and who are doing podcasts about the show. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Thanks guys. Us. Thanks, set dressers. You rule. Mm-hmm. Keep us in business. What do you think of? The line, this is why everyone hates moral philosophy professors. Do you think that everyone hates them? (laughs) I think they would probably come across as very self-righteous. Oh, oh, okay. Interesting. Very, I'm better than you. Hmm. Kind of like Tahani. Wow. (laughs) That is so not how I think of that, but okay. No. I think that people, I think that that phrase works because... Moral philosophy professors would be kind of like cheaty, right? They show you and they explore a ton of different 
theories, but they don't necessarily have an answer to anything. Mm. So here's all the here's what all these people think and do and practice. Mm-hmm. So you got to figure out what you want to do because I got nothing for you. I'll just show you all these different possibilities. Yeah, basically. It's like, I can't actually give you an answer, but I can give you a bunch of answers. Right. A bunch of possible answers, Mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, I think that's what would be frustrating. Because if you're going into that feeling like, oh, I'm going to get real answers about morality, about, you know, how to treat people and how to think about all kinds of just difficult topics, I guess, right? And then you're presented with, a whole... Well, you got a whole slew Like, indefinite of new... amount of possibilities. Like, it's just... It's, in, it's insane. Yeah, you thought yeah. the answer would be, like, black and white, but now suddenly there's a bajillion different shades of gray. Yeah, and basically. Your problems just became infinitely worse. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So they must be miserable people. Yeah, basically. So we've touched on Kant's moral theories before, but I'll just go over them a little... Um, I'll just go over them briefly. So Kant viewed morality in an almost mathematical way. He thought that there were commands that you must follow regardless of your desires. He believed that moral obligations were derived from pure reason. So it doesn't matter whether you want to be moral or not. The moral law is binding on all of us, which I think can apply to Eleanor and everyone that didn't get into the good place and the point system. Like, whether or not well, yeah, anybody on earth. Well, yeah, it's formula right there. Yeah, so exactly. Regardless of the situation, it's one plus one equals heaven or it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. And it didn't matter whether or not people on earth wanted to do right. They wanted to be moral. The, the law was binding on them anyway, right? So according to Kant, if you approve of lying, then you're universalizing that action. You're saying that everyone should always lie, which makes no sense, right? No one would ever say that everyone should always lie. And if you are able to do it, then everybody should be able to do it. And I think that's what Chidi's really having a problem with in this episode. He brings up Kant when he's talking to his girlfriend and he brings up that he thinks that lying is bad no matter what. And that's his problem is... Suddenly, he's put into this place where he's wondering, oh, well, if I do this, then I'm saying that it's okay for everybody to do this. Mm -hmm. And do I want to live in a world where everybody can lie whenever? Even if it is just for social niceties. Mm -hmm. Would I prefer to live in a world where people are honest, even if that honest is at times brutal? Or do I want to live in this world that I am creating right now? I think that's his issue. And we see that he hasn't really gotten a lot better at it because he's still struggling with that in the good place. Yep. Yep. Indecisive cheaty. Oh, definitely. Unable to think for himself. Do you think that's what that is? I think he's so bombarded with education and with these other philosophers and how they think and how they view the world that he's unable to take all that and decide for himself. He's basing everything that he thinks on a specific person or a specific principle. And I think that the most important thing for anybody to do is take all the information they have, form their own opinion, and go from there. Mm. Especially when it comes to non-scientific evidence. That's what I'm talking about. I'm I'm not talking about take the evidence of something that you're shown like water turning into ice and then form your own opinion on whether that's real or not. I'm not talking about that. (laughs) I'm talking about philosophy and theology and stuff like that. Things that can be debated. Things that are not fact. Exactly. Yeah. So Chidi should be able to take the information he has, put it into the context that he is in, Mm -hmm. and decide. Yeah. And make the judgment call from there. Right. And not think, yeah. what would Kant do? Or you know, what does utilitarianism say about this situation? It's, what does it say about this situation? What does Kant say about this situation? Do I agree with it? Can I apply it? Life would be so much easier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think that's that's his 
desire. I don't think he wants life to be easy. I think he, he likes wants to be in to pain. Be... In other words, that's what you're saying. No, I think he wants to be moral. But and it's hard is... to be moral all the time. Right. But morality is relative. Oh, it is. And that's part of the problem. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, T.D. does not make life easy on himself. I'm <laughs> no, not he saying doesn't. he's doing that. I just think that he, in his mind, there's a higher purpose to just making life easy for yourself. Do you think he thinks there's one right answer? One right philosopher? Or is he picking and choosing depending on the situation? I don't know if he thinks that there's one right philosopher. Because he seems to be siding on the fence of Kant. Yeah, in this in this particular instance, yeah. But then at the same time, he agreed to lie to Michael to help Eleanor. So even Chidi can't decide. Yeah, and I think, like, I get that. I get that it's hard to figure out where to get your guidance from and how to always apply that kind of learning, mm-hmm. you know? I I get it. It, It's not easy to do when I think you're always thinking about it. All right. So after talking about it, do you like the flashbacks more or less? The same? The same. The same. Okay. We can talk about them more later on in the episode, but. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. Let's move on. Tahani's planning a celebratory, reverential, bittersweet, upbeat, fun, and effortless party, where Michael explains retirement is an extreme form of punishment. Chidi insists Eleanor confess, but she comes up with a plan to kill Janet in order to save Michael from retirement while maintaining her cover. Wow. This episode, though. There's, Mm. like, a lot of stuff that happens in this episode that I really enjoy Mm -hmm. and that I find very fascinating. Really? Yes. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Before you'd watched the entire series? Yes. Definitely. I didn't expect the show to go in this direction. I never, ever considered that anybody would think about killing Janet or shutting her off, however you Yeah, I never thought Michael that. would be leaving. I never thought Michael would be leaving. And when he brings up his retirement, I was so shocked because... That seems incredibly unjust. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't seem very good. Yeah, like why would... I understand that he did something risky by living in the neighborhood that he created, but why would retirement mean an eternity of torture? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Because he failed? I guess. It's forced retirement because he's a failure? So maybe retirement is more like... Because retirement implies that you finished your job, yeah. you know, and you're just, you're you're done working at this point. And in this case, it might be more of, we're cutting you off. Yeah, you failed at your task, so. You're done here. Yeah, but that doesn't seem very heavenly now, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> no. It's, uh, it's pretty weird, for sure. But really, what interests me here is Eleanor and Chidi and their opposing views of Janet, you know, Mm -hmm. Eleanor really just thinks of Janet as a robot. Right. Eleanor kind of grasps the whole situation. Yeah. Whereas Chidi thinks of Janet as Mm -hmm. person-like. And immediately we get get that uh, because she says, Eleanor says, Janet is a non-human object sent here to help us. But then Chidi's response is, well, killing is one of the most famous moral Mm no-nos. Like, you can't do that. But how can you kill something that isn't real? Exactly. It's very interesting. I don't know. I I really... Did you have any thoughts on Michael's retirement or this plan? Like, did you think that this was a good idea for Eleanor? Like To just let him retire? Quote-unquote retire? Mm -hmm. I think once she found out what was going to happen to him, then her point of view would change. Yeah. And yet we still see her trying to get out of it somehow. Yeah. Right? To make it work for her still. Exactly. Because in the first part of the episode, she's saying, well, this is great for him and for me, and it's a perfect solution. He's going to be happy, lounging, doing all retirement stuff. Yeah. But that's not the case. 
Yeah, and now she's trying to think of another way for him to stay in the good place. Mm -hmm. But also to somehow throw Tahani under the bus, potentially. (laughs) Yeah. And to get her house. So she's like, three birds with one stone. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. She's still trying to make it work to her advantage. There's a really selfish streak there. She's still Eleanor. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At Tahani's solemn farewell party, Michael mourns all the human things he will never be able to do. Meanwhile, Janet leads Eleanor and Chidi to her kill switch. Janet's failsafe of begging for her life proves difficult to ignore. Jason arrives and Chidi accidentally presses the button while trying to prevent Jason from doing exactly that. It's interesting that you put accidentally presses the button where I interpret it as Chidi wanted to press it because he said it would be more difficult to be a bystander, he shoves Jason's hand out of the way and presses it himself because he has to be the one to do it. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I definitely saw it as accidental. I figured that as he was trying to push Jason away, he just put his hand on it, not really thinking. Hmm. Um, But yeah, I wonder what our listeners think and what other viewers think about that. Was that intentional on his part or did he accidentally press it? Chini never says, well, the only reason I pressed the button was to keep you from pressing the button. Yeah, or he never says... It was an accident. It was an accident. Exactly. Right. So either way, it could be interpreted either way. And he does say, like, I think I should press it. It would be worse to be a bystander. And he does get closer to the button until Janet's failsafe starts to work and he uh, yeah, feels too nervous about pressing it. So what do you think of the failsafe? <laughs> that is one effective failsafe. Yes, it I is. I have to say, yeah. I agree with Janet when she's like, it is a very effective failsafe. And, and Eleanor is saying, oh, it's so realistic. Like, yeah, I would have a really hard time pressing it. And I, I think. think that was one of the f- first time up until this point that we see Darcy Carden act like a regular person because up until at this point she's been robotic she's been robotic but she's also she's had quips and yeah she's had her little moments uh especially in the episode where michael is trying to get chidi to try all these new different Mm -hmm. hobbies and he's giving janet all these different personality quirks that's true yep so we do get that moment from right from darcy we did see some of that when she was wearing the... Yeah, but this feels like a more natural mask. person. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with you there. More emotion. Yeah. And luckily, we do see some more of that in the next few episodes. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> we we see some fantastic acting from Darcy. Oh, definitely. She kills it. So... <laughs> <laughs> too soon. <laughs> too I think soon. that was too soon. <laughs> By exactly nine days. <laughs> um... Does it seem odd to you that Chidi is even going with Eleanor to the kill switch or that he doesn't fight her more? Because I feel like he just, I felt as though it was a little out of character for him not to continue fighting her. Because when Eleanor says, well, who should do it? And he says, well, I think I should do it because it would be worse being a bystander. You seem to agree pretty quickly. Yeah, but I don't really believe that from Chidi. I feel like he would just be completely stuck, not knowing what to do, or still trying to convince Eleanor to not do this. So in my head, it seems like a decent walk for them to get to that point. And they probably argued for a significant portion of that walk. All right, okay. And Chidi, to me, is not one to be a bystander he's not gonna stay back or even stay in the possibility that eleanor does go and hit the switch Mm -hmm. he's not gonna want to be at home when this happens he needs to be there in hopes that he could sway her convince her not to i guess it just seems but i i agree with you it just seems like it happened too quickly But in your mind, he didn't do it accidentally. He pressed that button on purpose. Yeah. Do you really think Chidi would ever press that button on purpose? Like, does this fit in your mind? I think he would be too conflicted. But if he's sitting there going, oh, should I, shouldn't I, Eleanor would swoop in and do it. Yeah, I feel like that makes more sense than him doing it, though. Yeah, I agree. 
I don't think this is characteristic of Gigi at all. Mm -hmm. So that is a little frustrating. Yeah, which is exactly why I think it's accidental, but that it still bugs me when he even says, well, I think I should do it. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? Where is this coming from? You do? Since when? Why yeah. would you want to do the bad thing? Yeah. I don't know. It just, it, it didn't read as very in character for me. Did you think it was a strong choice to have him kill Janet instead of having Jason kill Janet or Eleanor kill Janet? It puts him on almost on the same level as them. Oh. So he's now done something. He, in his mind, is equivalent of killing. So he has now done something that would get him sent to the bad place. Oh. So. So he thinks now that he's immoral, like they are? Yeah, he's as bad as them. Mm -hmm. I don't think this makes sense for Chidi's character to do this, like we just said, but I think that's what just happened. I think that's why the writers on the show had Chidi press the button. Mm -hmm. So now everybody's on equal ground. Oh, interesting. Okay. Jason doesn't belong there. Eleanor doesn't belong there. And now Chidi did something that would make him not belong there. Mm, if he mm -hmm. had done this on Earth. Because in his mind, he is killing somebody. Yeah. I think it's a really strong... Even though it feels a little out of character for Chidi to even consider doing this, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, I think that it was a really strong choice, story-wise, because this is what pushes Eleanor to be honest. At the end of the episode. Yeah, yeah. I think seeing that she has contributed to somebody's like bad deeds, especially someone as moral and good as Chidi is, I think that pushes her over. And she sees how upset he is over it. Yeah, exactly. And realizes, you know, maybe this is how I should feel when I do bad things. Maybe I shouldn't be just <laughs> happy that I get away with it. Maybe right. I should actually feel guilt. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I think it was a it was a good idea on the um on the part of the writers, definitely. So let's talk about Janet for a moment. Yes. Janet, as Eleanor says, is a robot. She's yes. not a person. Chidi says she grows, she learns, she's essentially a person. Mm hmm Because he asks her how many different Janets have there been, and she says twenty five. And yeah. each one learns from the previous iteration yeah she says each new update of janet gains more wisdom and social abilities right so according to chidi that is growth and that shows that she is living a life right living a mm -hmm. life so our next topic of conversation should be is janet a person yeah is janet a person and we get two conflicting views in this episode so I did a little bit of research. Well, the two of us did a little bit of research. So I'll put the link to a couple of great Crash Course videos on these topics in the show notes. So there's a lot of controversy on this topic. Um, some philosophers believe that a person does not equal a human because a human is a biological term while a person is a moral term. So humanity doesn't make someone a person. Persons are beings who are part of our moral community and they deserve moral consideration. So then the question becomes, what must one possess to be deserving of our moral consideration? Uh, Mary Ann Warren, a modern American philosopher, came up with a list of cognitive criteria for personhood. So trying to figure out what makes a thing, a, a being, a person. Mm -hmm. And she came up with five different criteria. First was consciousness. This would be consciousness of objects and events external and or internal to the being, and in particular, the capacity to feel pain. Janet doesn't fit this criteria. No, she does not. She is conscious of herself, but she does not feel pain. And she even assures Chidi that her death will not bring her any pain. She says, I'm not human. I do not feel pain. Right. So right there, she says she's not human, which mm -hmm. we know. Because mm -hmm. she is not human. Yeah. But that oh. may not mean she's not a person. Exactly. The second criteria is reasoning. The developed capacity to solve new and relatively complex problems. Janet can do that. Yep. She knows all the knowledge in the entire universe. So she can definitely reason. Uh, the third criteria is self-motivated activity. 
which is activity which is relatively independent of either genetic or direct external control. In my opinion, Janet's activity is motivated primarily by the desires of others. Like she is there to serve other people and to get them things that they want, help them in any way that she can. Because that's what she's programmed to do. Exactly. But in this episode, we kind of get a little hint that she might have some desires of her own. Because she says... That with each new update that she gets, even though she doesn't exactly have a birthday and she can't eat, she still likes to take a piece of birthday cake and smash it around where her mouth is. Right. You know? And that's kind of a little ritual like She's a probably not programmed to do that. That's probably something that she decided to do. Exactly. So she doesn't really fit that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but we see that there might be a little bit more there than we know of at this point. The fourth criteria is the capacity to communicate by whatever means, which means that they can talk about an indefinite number of possible contents, but also um, an indefinite number of topics. So able to communicate about many topics uh, in many different ways. And we know that Jana can do this. Definitely. And the last one, the presence of self-concepts and self-awareness, either individual or racial or both. So she is aware of herself. She knows that she exists. She knows her place in this world, Mm -hmm. you know, as this informational vessel. Yeah. But she never thinks of herself as a person. She doesn't think of herself as human. So should we think of her as a person, Mm -hmm. right? She constantly reminds Chidi that she's not a person, and yet he still thinks that she is. So let's see. How many of those criteria does she actually fit? Uh, The first, consciousness, no. Reasoning, yes. Self-motivated activity, not really. The capacity to communicate, yes. And the presence of self-concepts and self-awareness, yes. So she only meets three out of the five criteria. Mm Mm-hmm. So for Mary Ann Warren, she would not be a person. Right. Yes. This list was actually created to discuss abortion. Because a fetus is not self-aware. Mm-hmm. Does not have consciousness, reasoning, self-motivated activity, the capacity to communicate, or as you said, self-awareness. Right. Yes. So in Mary Ann Warren's mind, a fetus is not a person. Mm-hmm. This list of cognitive criteria for personhood actually works for other beings, not just fetuses. It Mm -hmm. can also work for very young children who are not self-aware. Exactly. Yeah. They don't have the capacity to communicate and they don't have reasoning abilities. So. Right. Sadly. uh, Even small children. Yeah. This list would exclude young children, like infants, Mm -hmm. and would also exclude people who are for example in like a vegetative state right or even people in comas um i think it would depend on how long the coma is but yeah Yeah. basically if they're in a persistent vegetative state um someone who's been in a coma for years and years Mm -hmm. yeah this would include exclude them from being a person so marianne's list not perfect not perfect no But a good jumping off point. We do have another list. Now, according to John T. Noonan, he says his list is very simple. It's one single item. A person is a person if they have human DNA. That's it. Yeah. So Janet would not meet this criteria. She does not have human DNA. Right. As far as we know, I'm guessing she doesn't. She just can't eat. She doesn't need to eat. Yeah. She looks... Human, but that's pretty much it. She's probably just a robot. Yeah. So, according to Noonan, she is not a person. She is not a person. And finally, there's the social criterion idea, which states that you're a person if people recognize you as a person. Yeah, and they care about you. And they care about you. So this kind of applies to Janet. Right. Because Chidi cares about her. Yeah. Uh... Jason seems to care fairly a little, like a little bit about her. Yeah. And Michael does too, Mm -hmm. right? 
he's upset. He calls her like a sweet uh, child, I think. And And he calls her our sister in one of the deleted scenes. Yes, he does. Uh, Avenger extended, sister. Yeah, yeah. Avenger sister in the extended episode. Mm-hmm. And they have a funeral for her mm-hmm. like you would for a person. Right. Right. So in that in that view, she would be one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is really a question that's relevant to a lot of fiction, um, like the Cylons in Battlestar Galactica, or Superman, or the robot in iRobot, AI. Or even Schwarzenegger in Terminator. Yeah, yeah, okay. And movies like Ex Machina. Mm-hmm. And it could even almost be applied to the demons on Buffy and Angel. Right. Even though they are not robots. There's a lot of time where they're not thought of as persons. And according to Noonan, these vampires have human DNA. Wow. So they are people. Yeah. And I think that uh, in Buffy and Angel, the vampires tend to be more... They tend to be treated more like they are persons yeah. than demons that don't look like people. Yeah. I mean, you have right? Anya and you have Angel and Spike and like they all look like people. Exactly. But then you get someone like Lorne, who is treated like a person, but then you have other beings, other demons in the episodes where they're just killing them left, right, and center, right? Yeah. They don't think of them as persons. Anyway, off of that tangent. Right. We're not talking, (laughs) we're not here to talk about Buffy. Oh, if only. (laughs) (laughs) There were a few different tests created to discover artificial intelligence in a being. One of the most famous ones is the Turing test. Mm Mm-hmm. This was created by Alan Turing in, I believe, the 50s. So it was a while ago. Yes. Um, And the test basically said that if we can't tell the difference between artificial intelligence and a person, then there really is no difference. When having a discussion. Mm Mm-hmm. So if you can have a discussion with a robot and it can fool you into believing that it is a person, then there really is no difference. Right. That being would be a person. But we already know that Janet's not human. So this test is irrelevant. Despite the fact that she would pass it with flying colors. Would she, though? I think so. I don't think she would. I think behind closed doors, if you're having a conversation with her, like a legitimate conversation, Mm -hmm. she would be able to fool you. I don't think she would. Really? How come? Right at the beginning of the episode, Michael says, will you be okay? And she says, well, yes, this will not affect me in any way. And she has to demonstrate her approximation of human crying. Like, I don't think she could actually fool you into believing she's an emotional being like humans Mm. are. We have several people in the world that talk really weird. Oh, yeah. No. The world's full of weirdos. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But I can't imagine someone saying, this is my best approximation of human crying. Unless they're trying to make a joke. But but, both of those situations, she was talking... With Michael. Okay. So every time that she talks to somebody without Michael present seems to be more natural. Okay. For example, when she's serving frozen yogurt, that interaction with Eleanor is more down to earth. Oh, yeah. It's very natural for sure. But if you were to just straight out ask her, are you... A person? Are you a human being right. or a robot? She would say. That's absolutely true. You're I'm, totally I'm right about not that. Real. You're right. Yeah. So I don't think she would be able to pass the Turing test. And that would be a dead giveaway. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. For anybody who's really interested in this type of discussion, I definitely recommend Ex Machina. Yes. That movie yes, is fantastic. Very, yeah. Very interesting, and it really takes the Turing test to a whole new level. And the BBC show Black Mirror, if you've never watched that, there's a few episodes that really make you question whether AI is a good idea or not, especially mm-hmm. the episode Be Right Back from season two. Definitely watch that one. Okay. Super I don't good. think I've seen that episode, so I've, now I want to. It's really good. Yeah. All right. And the other experiment I want to bring up is John Cyril's experiment, the Chinese room. Well, first, let's talk about two different types of AI. Strong oh, yeah. AI and weak AI. Yeah. Do you think Janet is strong or weak AI? I mean, 
from the description that you just said, she would tell you right away that she's a robot. Mm -hmm. But she also, I don't know, because I feel like she's strong AI, but strong AI can pass the Turing test. And we haven't really... Well, that's what... That's what Turing says, mm -hmm. but then a lot of people have said that strong AI will never happen. Would not be able to pass that test, or yeah, that that's still too complicated. Some some people say that they wouldn't be able to. Because the difference between strong and weak AI would be the AI in Siri on your phone, or mm -hmm. you know anything on your phone that has to do with interpreting you. Mm -hmm. And that's all weak AI. And that's, we're totally, and in, in video games as well, where the AI, maybe they're fighting you or whatever. That's also weak AI because it's all reactionary. Yeah. Most of the situations, it's all programmed. Mm -hmm. They don't learn. They don't, whatever. Everything's programmed. Yeah. So strong AI would be actually learning. Like taking something that's not programmed and doing something else. Yeah. And... The ability to have self-motivated activity and self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So this experiment, the Chinese room experiment. Uh, yes, the Chinese room experiment explains a situation where two native Chinese speakers are on one side of, of a door and they're passing messages to someone on the other side of that door. and In Chinese. Yes, in Chinese. The person on the other side of that door is able to respond to the messages through a certain pattern. They have a code book. Yeah, a code book. But they don't actually understand Chinese. Mm -hmm. Right? So even though you can respond and you can fool the other people into believing that you speak Chinese, you don't actually understand what you're doing. So this, right. this experiment would say that strong AI would require that the machine have actual understanding. Do you think that Janet has actual understanding? No. No? No. Why? Because she's not programmed to. She's not programmed to be a free thinker. Okay. She is a tool. That's what she was built for. So you think that Janet is weak AI? Yes. Yeah. Is that sad to realize? A little. Why? Because she's so human to me. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so then this is the this is the conversation I really want to have. Um, now that we've talked about personhood and uh, and artificial intelligence, who do you agree with, Eleanor or Chidi? Do you view Janet as a person, or do you see her as a vessel of knowledge that is only there for people's to make people's lives easier? Can it be both? Oh, okay. <laughs> because I can have a conversation with Janet. I could have a back and forth. I could ask her questions. I can ask advice, whatever. She would probably give me weird answers. Mm -hmm. But I think I would still know that she's a robot. I would still completely understand. And I would be, at the end of the day, I know she's a robot. But... The way she looks, the way she talks and walks and acts is so human that I could almost forget. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you were in this situation, do you think that you could press that button? Yes. Yeah? Okay. I think I could too. That defense mechanism would be difficult to get past though. <laughs> oh, definitely. No, yeah. it would not be easy. But... This is why Janet is so interesting to me is because in a lot of other uh, shows or movies that deal with artificial intelligence, those beings tend to be like fairly emotional or have their own agenda. Like they have a purpose that they want to fulfill and it's usually something that they personally have uh, have come up with. Like, they have self-motivated activity. Like what? Like, in AI, like, he wants to be human. He seems human. He acts human to other people. Haley Joel is, Osment? Yeah, he's emotionally attached to other people. Like, he's not going around saying, don't worry, I'm a robot. Mm -hmm. Like, there's none of that. Right. In Ex Machina, even though he knows... 
the guy who's doing the Turing test on the robot knows that she's a robot, mm-hmm. but she still has her own agenda. She's still able oh, to yeah, emotionally, like, I don't want to say manipulate, but like emotionally influence him and create a bond with him. Mm-hmm. That we don't see Janet doing with any of the resonance here. Right. She's not trying to bond with anybody. No, exactly. And then you have movies like Terminator 2, where Schwarzenegger is obviously a robot, Mm -hmm. but he still is a learning computer. He's Mm -hmm. he's a neural net processor, which is a learning computer. And, (laughs) And John Connor is trying to make this bond and this connection with him, and he's attempting to do the same. So he's trying to learn... To care for John Connor. The AI is strong. Way too strong. Yeah. And I feel like we're just presented a different kind of AI here. She's likely a weak AI. Mm -hmm. Which it it sounds mean to say. It's like, oh, Janet. Like, I love Janet and she's great. It's okay, Janet. You're not um, weak. Yeah. And weak makes it sound like she's stupid. But that's not exactly what we mean. It's, It's just interesting to have... A character, like a robot, who has no desire to appear human or to act more human. Mm -hmm. Like, she is who she is, and she's very aware of that, and she will not hesitate to remind people of it. So, that's why I feel like it would be fairly easy to do what Eleanor does, to shut her off. I don't think I would have as big of a moral crisis as Chidi does in this mm-hmm. episode. Exactly. Although I can understand sort of why he does. He really feels like she's human or like she's a person, right? And if he thinks that she's a person, then killing her is just unacceptable. Yeah. Morality's biggest no-no. Definitely. It's biggest no-no. So we both say that we would kill Janet. Yep. Wow. Okay. Well. We're not horrible people because she's not a person. Not in our eyes. See, I wonder what our listeners are going to say. I wonder if some of them are going to disagree with us and say, no, Janet is strong AI. She is human enough. She is a person and Mm -hmm. it isn't right to. A giant announcement of Janet repeating, attention, I have been murdered, plays on a loop for the whole neighborhood. Chidi is incredibly stressed out. Michael rallies everyone to avenge the murder of Janet. At the funeral, a new model of Janet suddenly appears. Do you feel like the show is asking us to think in one particular way? I think the show is showing us both sides of the story or Mm -hmm. both sides very effectively. But do you think it's telling us which decision is more moral or leaving that up to us? I would say no, except they have the big TV screen with her saying, I've been murdered. I've been murdered. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Janet would say that. I think she's she's say, been programmed to say it, right? Exactly. So I think she would be if it was just her. She would say, "I've been shut down," or "I've been deactivated." Mm-hmm. She does call it a kill switch. That's true. But then she does say things like, "It'll just shut me down," or something to that effect, like using less violent language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is, no, I don't think the show is telling us to think one way or another. Yeah. And I kind of like that it isn't. Uh, It's giving us the opportunity to really think for ourselves, like, what would we do in Mm -hmm. this situation? It's not saying anything was wrong. It's not saying anything was right. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, they're they're humanizing it extremely well by giving her a funeral, Mm -hmm. putting her in the casket. Mm Mm-hmm calling it a murder yep so and with michael deciding to avenge the slaughter of mm-hmm. our sister so for the extended episode of the eternal shriek mm-hmm. we have an extra scene that isn't in the aired version yes we have a whole ex- extra scene which mm-hmm. i was so surprised to see when i was watching the extended episode i was like i don't remember any of this yeah it was really nice to get shown something new Mm -hmm. instead of just little extensions of scenes yeah so we see michael and the town Mm -hmm. at the beach with janet's murdered body yes face down in the ground and and we have michael telling tahani that 
her retirement party for for him was not very successful. And we have Chidi panicking about keeping this lie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's kind of an important part of the episode that they should have kept in. And I don't know how they would have done that, though. I feel like Chidi's panicking is the most important part of that scene. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like the rest of it is that important. Okay. Especially to Hani's rambling about, oh, this party is going to be just as good as, insert incredibly long name of party. Right. You know, I don't feel like any of that's that important or really that funny. She was begging for another chance, right? Yeah, she's begging yes. for another chance, but I don't really think that's that important. Okay. Um, But Chidi panicking... Yeah, that feels that feels big. I mean, we see him panic again later on, but but this for is a different his, reason. Yeah, this is his first moment, and this is him really being faced with, in his mind, the body of Janet that he has just murdered. Yeah, like he said, "I'm sorry," and then ran from her, and then was forced to come back and face what he did. Yeah, and in that moment. He says, this is too much for me. I can't maintain this fiction. It's too much, Eleanor. And he looks like he's on the verge of having a full-on panic attack. I really feel for him in that moment. I have had panic attacks. They are the worst. (laughs) Um, They're awful. And I do not envy him just feeling completely overwhelmed at this moment. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so I really feel for him here. I like what this scene does because it just makes me sympathetic towards him. Really shows you everything that he's dealing with. Mm -hmm. How it really eating him up inside. Yeah. And we get get that later on. Like he tells us, but for some reason this moment works a lot better for me and makes me sympathize with him even more just because I see that he's on that verge. Like he's breathing heavily. Like, William Jackson Harper is doing a fantastic job in that scene. Mm-hmm. He really makes me believe that Chidi is just... He can't handle this. He really can't. Yeah. yeah. Emotionally, physically, all of it. He just can't. And Eleanor and Jason carrying him back into town. Oh, goodness. Because he's just yeah. so yeah incapacitated. Yeah. Emotionally, physically. And they're... We end up burning him. Oh, God. Okay, that moment, as much as I feel for Chidi, that moment is pretty fantastic. It was great. They're both kind of laughing, and they're like, Ah, you're a dead guy in sunglasses. Get it? (laughs) And then seeing Chidi say, I've never been more stressed out in my entire life is just, it's such a nice contrast, you know? That's a great joke. So that part is cut in the televised version, Mm -hmm. rallying the town to avenge Janet. And I kind of get why. They cut that because that never happens. The town rallies around Janet's body and then they go to her funeral. Yeah. And well, Michael says that he wants to find out who murdered Janet. Sure. And he asks her as soon as the new one appears, Mm -hmm. but there's no pitchforks and... Right, torches and... No, we're not all of a sudden becoming a mob. Right. Yeah. Um, I do like... The little edition of Chidi's favorite things. Uh, when oh, Eleanor gosh. tells him, you know, to stay calm and just think of his favorite things. And he says his favorite things are ethics, reading, drinking milk after I take my lactose intolerance medication, quiet movies, fitted bed sheets, cool seeds, a new bookmark, and unsalted almonds. Cool seeds. <laughs> I love Chidi. He's such a... He's so like. There's no word for what Chidi he's is. He's an unsalted saltine, you know. He's like bland uh, in a way. Yeah. I just I think it's really funny. His his favorite things are so <sighs> just so bland, pathetic, kind boring, kind of sad, all oh, pretty boring. Yeah. yeah. But I think they're really sweet because they're all nice, calming things too. Like, nothing yeah, is... because he's always filled with inner turmoil. So he needs calming things to keep him grounded. Because Aww. he's just churning up inside like a whirlpool 24-7. Because that's what happens when you're a teacher of ethics and morality. <laughs> okay, so that's, like, never going to be a job of yours. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> right. Yeah. My first and last course would be, think for yourself, you free thinkers. <laughs> you go. Go into the world. Oh, goodness. Just don't kill nobody. 
Just don't kill nobody. Okay. All right. Good. Y'all yeah. get A's. That was uh, Ethics with Jason. Yep. Ethics 101. Yeah. That was a really short, condensed version. It's okay. Y'all got A's just for listening. <laughs> we got an email from Alan, one of our listeners, who pointed out an inconsistency in the funeral scene. He asks, where does Tahani get the black balloons, the coffin, and the funeral banner if Janet is dead? Do you have any answers to that? Because I feel like it's just an inconsistency. Why wouldn't she just go to the balloon store or the party store? Why would there be banners that say funeral? You're in the good place. No one dies here. Unless it's like a funeral for your fun. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure, but... And why would there be coffins? Yeah, I don't know where the coffin would have come from. That seems a little Mm -hmm. fishy, because obviously Janet could give you whatever you want. Yeah. But... Janet's... Janet's... Non-operational right right now. Non-operational. Interesting. I mean, the balloons, I could could totally acknowledge. Like, I can can forgive the balloons. Yeah, I could forgive the balloons. It's like Tahani just having a supply of every color balloon in the house because she plans so many parties. Yeah, the coffin and the banner... Yeah, it's Don't a make little... a lot of sense. Unless yeah. Michael. Unless, yeah, unless Michael provided them. Yeah. It's possible that Michael is able to do all that too. I mean, I would totally buy that for Michael. Oh, yeah. Being an architect, he yeah. can just do whatever he wants. So... But he's too busy to do that kind of stuff on a daily basis, which is why Janet exists. Janet. Right. And also because he's the only architect who lives And he's not supposed to be there. So I'm going to go with Michael. Mm -hmm. Tahani asked Michael for a coffin and a banner. Yep. That's what I'll go with too. All right, Alan. There you go. Here's your answer. (laughs) Yeah. Hopefully uh, you you can buy into that headcanon too. And we also got an email from Ben who asked us what we make of Janet's new outfit and hair. So when she pops up and we've got our new version of Janet, Mm -hmm. who is adorable, by the way, her... Mm -hmm. Her big smile and her, hello, hello. Yeah, that doesn't get old quick. Really? Oh, I love it. <laughs> I think it's so cute. Um, What did you think? Do you think it's significant anyway? Do you just feel like it's a visual cue? I think it's a visual cue showing us that this is a new Janet. Mm-hmm. She's no longer the same Janet wearing that dress and blue top. Yeah, actually, I noticed that the first, like the first Janet we have is dressed with a white and blue blouse. Mm -hmm. And then she's got a dark, dark purple uh, vest and skirt. Yeah. And then our new Janet, like our new version of Janet, has a light purple vest and skirt. And she has kind of a dark green, blue type of blouse underneath. And I don't really think that there's a lot of symbolism here. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like it's mostly just a visual cue. It kind of just reminds me of the colors of a peacock. Oh, I didn't think of that. Because Michael's peacock outfit, but I don't see what the symbolism could could be for that. Well, remember peacock was what, a symbol of guidance and wisdom? Yeah, yeah. Which works for Janet, right? That's true. Like it does. she, she is wise in the sense that she knows everything in the universe, mm-hmm. or eventually will know everything in the universe. But I think it's really easy to find meaning in colors because yeah. colors just tend to have so many meanings that you can make them fit. Sometimes the blue curtains are just blue. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In literature, it's a little bit different, I find, but. In TV shows, sometimes just what the outfit is wearing is what looks good on that particular actor. Sure, yeah. But if we are looking for meaning, we can find some. Um, So her first, we've talked about her first and her second outfit. And in her first outfit, her blouse kind of looks like a cloudy blue sky. And blue is a very safe, non-threatening color that represents wisdom and clarity, which works for uh for Janet. And deep purple represents mourning, magic and spirituality. So that's kind of interesting, like thinking of her outfit as sort of representing, you know, this afterlife, like mourning, but also spirituality. But then light purple, like that kind of lilac that she's wearing, the new in the new outfit, 
represents immaturity and superficiality. It is extroverted and enthusiastic. Just like New Janet. Just like our New Janet. So, I think it works. I don't think it's... um... Coincidence? (laughs) Sorry, sorry. (laughs) You feel like it's coincidence. Uh, I don't like overthinking colors unless it's a specific pattern or things that are more obvious to me like paintings or Mm -hmm. pieces of music. Those feel very symbolic to me. But colors can be very deterministic of what looks good on film, what looks good with the other set pieces in contrast with other actors' clothes. Mm -hmm. You'll find a lot of sitcoms characters will be using primary colors as their main colors for shirts. You'll find that Mm -hmm. a lot in Seinfeld and Friends. Um, But I just don't like looking into specific colors too much. Okay. I think it's there if you want it to be there. Mm -hmm. And it might add a certain layer. Yeah. But I don't think it was intended. Okay. Yeah. I don't really think it was intended. I think it was more of a visual cue. But it is nice to see in a way that she still maintains pretty much the same outfit. Like structurally, it's the same outfit. Right. The only difference is the color. And so it is kind of nice to think about, well, why might they have chosen that color? As we progress in the next few episodes, we'll see if she changes her outfit at all. Yeah, we'll see if uh, Janet's outfit changes. And I like her hair up. Darcy Carden looks nice with her hair up, I think. But that's just me. Thinking she's pretty. I didn't notice. You didn't notice that her hair was up? No. Oh my goodness, okay. (laughs) I'm such a guy, right? Yeah, I guess. Um... (laughs) Uh, if we want to talk about color, we could talk about Michael's outfit. Usually his outfits are very colorful, have patterns. Mm-hmm. And now it's very bleak. Grays. Really? I honestly very, didn't notice Michael's outfit. Very pale. Desaturated. Oh. Yeah. Almost like he's losing joy. Yeah. He's just yeah. morose. Oh, that's sad. What's the... What was that word from last week? Oh, uh, should the party be moribund? Moribund and devastating. Yeah, yeah. His outfit is definitely moribund. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get to the end of the episode. That evening, Chidi tells Eleanor he cannot live with the lie, and he will confess to the murder of Janet. Eleanor convinces him to stay quiet, but Chidi explains that he will never be able to live with the moral quagmire that they've created. At a neighborhood gathering. Eleanor finally admits to everyone that she doesn't belong in the good place. Holy moly, what a turn of events. Did you expect that? Not even slightly. This episode really breaks that idea that the show is going to survive on the protagonist's secret. Yeah. So shows like Dexter, Breaking Bad, where for seasons long, nobody knows about the protagonist's secret. Yeah, they're continuously having to hide who they are. And then we get to this point, and I know when I was watching it, a lot of other fans had this kind of confused reaction. Like, where are we going to go now? I thought that this is what our whole first season was going to be about. This is the premise. Her hiding in heaven or hiding in the good place. Yeah, and a lot of people thought, well, how are they going to make this show last beyond a season if they're not keeping this secret going? You know? That's Will so Eleanor just be sent to the bad place next week? Right. But it's interesting because some people felt like the story was over in a way. Interesting. Like that's when it was going to end and that there wasn't really going to be more to resolve. But for me, I thought, well, now what? Like there's so many possibilities. That's so intriguing. And I was so excited to see what was going to happen right. next. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't wait to get on the next episode. Yeah. So in this scene... Again, riding with that same theme that Chidi believes Janet to be a person, he thinks that she's been harmed by this new update. He's like, she knew everything and now she's a baby. She knows nothing. She can barely say. Hey, now she knows her AB Janets. She does know her <laughs> AB Janets. That is like my favorite line of this that episode. That is a great I think. line. That's pretty great. Hey, she knows her AB Janets. It's it's interesting because he says like even if she is okay, it would be too painful for me to live with these lies. So, 
even if everything works out fine and Janet gets everything back and mm-hmm. she's the same old Janet, he still couldn't live with that, with the knowledge that he killed her. Yeah. That, but the thing, yeah, it, and for Eleanor, it's like, what does it matter? Big deal. You just rebooted her. Exactly. Who cares? You know, she's going to get all of her knowledge back in a few days and it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. But I think that his admission that he won't tell, like he's not going to confess about murdering Janet, but that he will never for all eternity be able to live with it is really what gets Eleanor to confess. I agree. Yeah. We see her sort of have this moment uh, where she's asking, asking without saying any words, Chidi to calm down when they're at the neighborhood meeting. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, he starts to panic, and she's like, she kind of, you know, gives him a look, like, calm down, calm down, it's fine. It's gonna be okay. But then she sees that he's still panicking. I don't feel like that's the first time she's realizing she should confess. I feel like she's been thinking about it ever since Chidi said he'll never be able to live with it. But it's just I think that in was that the nail moment. In the yeah, yeah, it was in that moment that she made up her mind. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, so we see that she's a flawed person, but she's not irredeemable. She's putting someone else's happiness above her own in this moment. And this, I believe, more than last episode with Michael, when you were sort of arguing that she was kind of giving herself up. Right. And I was saying I didn't really think that. And I think it's just because she has such a deeper, more personal connection to Chidi And she feels a sense of responsibility for him because of her actions, right? Like, everything... She's responsible for how he's feeling. Exactly. His inner turmoil. Yeah. And she knows that the only reason he feels this way is because of what she's done. He would would never have considered shutting off Janet if it wasn't for her. Right. So, I like this. We're seeing that she feels remorse, and we're seeing that she wants to make things right again. Mm Mm-hmm. This yep. is a great moment for Eleanor. And for all we know, it's her last moments in the good place. Yeah. Which is scary. Mm-hmm. It's like, what's going to happen? What will happen to Eleanor? Ugh. So overall, you like this episode? Great episode. Yeah? yeah. Great episode. Yeah. I think it's great too. I feel like the conflict really escalates naturally, but at a really brisk pace in this episode. So we begin with Michael believing that he's the source of destruction Then we discover he's going to be tortured for eternity. Then Chidi kills Janet and has to, you know, keep this secret. And then all of a sudden Eleanor reveals herself. It's just... Yeah, there's a lot. It's just... It kept going. Snap, snap, snap. Yeah, it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's a really great ending to this episode. Yeah. Yeah. I think this episode is one of my favorite episodes. Yeah. Except for... The flashbacks. Except for the flashbacks. Not a big fan of those flashbacks, but you know what? That's okay. I'll let it slide. So I think the rest of our thoughts are best left to the spoiler zone. All right. So if you've watched the whole show, then you can join us in the spoiler zone after the music. But if this is the end of your time with us today... Wait, what music? I didn't hear any music. Oh, do we put that in after the editing? Like yes. during the editing? Yes, we put it oh, in. Oh, we edit it in. Right. Yeah, yeah, with I editing the, magic. With editing magic. All right, so if you're signing off before the music, that brings us to the end of Forking Bullshit, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes. This really is the best way for others to find the show, and we love hearing your feedback, so please leave that review on iTunes. Every time we get an email, we get a little excited. Yeah. And if you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio, and use the hashtag FBullshirt if you have any uh, anything you want to say to us. Or you can find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. Yeah, that's right. C-A, because we're Canadian A. I'm going to use that all the time. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be over here. Yeah, and you can send us an email. And we will see you next week for our review of episode 8, Most Improved Player. 
Aww. So we get to find out where things go after Eleanor confesses. Da, da, da. Ba, ba. Okay. Three, two. Spoiler zone, spoiler zone, spoiling everything, spoiling movies, spoiling food. Darth Vader's his dad. <gasps> Gasp. As if you didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we actually got that in the first try, you guys. I didn't have to edit out a thing. One take. Boo yeah, we're getting professional at this. Okay, so wow. Yeah, so this episode is full of. Juicy tidbits after watching the whole series. Mm-hmm. I noticed Michael really ripping onto Honey. Oh my goodness, yeah. Really cutting her down. But the thing is, Michael does that all episode long. He's really just poking at her inability to plan a party, and mm-hmm. he's making it really hard to satisfy him. Yeah. But then at the end of the episode, he apologizes in this really sincere way, and that kind of confuses the whole plot for me a little bit. It seems odd that he would apologize and then not take another little jab in like he did a couple episodes ago Mm -hmm. um, when she was kind of doubting her her place here in the afterlife and he tells her, oh, no, you're you're one in uh, billions of people that made it here. But then at the end, he tells her, no, she had nothing to do with the sinkhole being repaired. So, like, he cuts into her yeah. right after his apology, but we don't get that in this episode. We don't get that. I think it would have worked a little bit better for me if there was a little moment of him doing that mm-hmm. right at the end. Yeah, I agree. So what do you think his plan is here? Why do you think he apologizes? The only thing I can think of would be he's putting her off guard again. Okay. By saying all these things and then apologizing so it makes her a bit more comfortable and then so he can just do it again. Right. That's the only thing I can think of. The only reason that he would be doing that. Yeah, I think so too. Because she does mention at one point that he was always there for her and that she didn't have very good parents. So he's kind of doing that almost abusive relationship type of thing where you put someone down so many times. And then you just apologize. And you apologize hoping that everything will be fine, but then you keep doing that same abusive behavior. Yeah. Ouch, that makes Michael seem super mean. I mean, He is. (sighs) This is the bad place. Right, he is. He is super mean. I think that this episode works a little bit better when you know everything that happens because... Now we have kind of the feeling that this retirement that Michael speaks of is actually the truth. The episode is called The Eternal Shriek, and it's basically eternal damnation. Yeah. Like, it is eternal torture. Yeah, exactly. And in this episode, when you're watching it for the first time, you're thinking, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why would, you know, like an architect... Yeah, an architect of the good place, why would they be sent to be tortured for the rest of eternity... But it makes perfect sense when you're thinking about, you know, uh, an architect of the bad place. Right. Failing at their job. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what happens to them. Now, do you think this is legit? Do you think he would, he was actually going to go? No, I don't think he was going to go. Right. No. I think that he set up Eleanor to kill Janet. Okay. I think that he set that in motion. Uh, At the beginning of the episode, we hear him tell everybody in the neighborhood... That Janet, the only way in and out of the good place is through a train and only Janet can operate that train. And he says it and looks directly at Eleanor. And then we have a little moment from Eleanor where she's sort of considering what that means. The gears are turning immediately. Yeah. And I think he sees that and knows his plan is... It's working. You know, it's, it's starting to brew in her mind. Yeah. So I really think he's the one who puts all of that in motion. I think that he added Janet's kill switch and also added the fail safe so that it would just be harder for them to do. Like that it would give them some sort of emotional distress in that moment, Mm -hmm. especially Chidi. And then 
I think that he added the attention, I have been murdered. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, And for I sure. think it's very deliberate the way that he talks about Janet. He calls her our sister. He he says slaughtered. He says killed. He says murdered. Like He's really driving home the point to Chidi that she is a human. She's a yeah. person. In an email we got from Alan, he said that he didn't really understand what Michael's plan was. He said, is this just to squeeze Chidi? Because surely he doesn't believe that Eleanor will step up the way that she does. If the idea is that these four people will torture each other, then why does he need to apply this extra pressure? Hurting Chidi hurts Eleanor. Yes. Well, hurting Chidi hurts Chidi, of course. Well, of course, And yeah. then it hurts Eleanor. So that's where those two factor in. Yeah. But why do you think that Michael puts this extra pressure on them if they're just meant to torture each other? Why not? Yeah. I think that's a good point. Why not? He can. I mean, he does it with Tahani. He says things. He pokes at her after all of his comments. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's doing. He's like, he's stoking the fire. Yeah. And I think that's actually what leads him to ultimately fail. Yeah. Because he gets too involved. Exactly. And if things just progress naturally then they would have been torturing each other for a lot longer because it would have taken them a lot longer to figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. But with Michael there adding all of this extra pressure, it eventually led Eleanor into figuring out that this is the bad place. Yeah. Yeah. I do like what Ben said in his email. The last moments of the episode show that Michael's plan will always fail because people rise to what is expected of them. I think that's a great take on humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day... Most people will do what's best and what's right. Yeah, I really do like Ben's take on this. I think this is interesting because we're setting up next season with Eleanor, past Eleanor, in a way, leading future Eleanor to Chidi, mm -hmm. right? So what Ben says is that this plan is always going to fail, right? Michael's plan. Yeah, Michael's plan yeah. for them to torture each other is always going to fail. And I think now I wonder... Do you think How that's... long it's going to take for it to fail next season. And yeah. if it'll fail in the way that we're expecting it to fail. I doubt it. I doubt the show it, yeah. always seems to surpass expectations. I think that Eleanor is the, the wild card. Mm. And the plan will always fail because of Eleanor. Because Eleanor does not act... She's... Predictably? She's unpredictable. Okay, yeah. I think so, too. And... It's, it reminds me of The Matrix, because Neo is basically the wild card in The Matrix, and he acts unpredictably mm -hmm. and completely screws everything up, or makes it better, depending on your, depending on you, whether you side with the agents or with the humans. So, it's interesting. <laughs> Don't most people side with the humans? Well, yeah, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if you're AI, then... You but don't no, side with the humans at all. Yeah, I guess so. All right. Do we have any last thoughts for our spoiler zone? I'm interested to see if we're going to have flashbacks next season. Right. Because we already know these characters. We know their past. We know how most of them have died. I wonder if maybe... We don't we'll... know how Tahani died, though. Oh, that's true. No, we never find out. Interesting. We know that okay. Eleanor was killed by... The stray shopping cart. Stray shopping cart also being hit by a car after that, I, or a truck. Yeah, a and... mobile billboard truck, I think he said. And then Chidi was uh, hit by an air conditioner falling and died from that. And Jason died from asphyxiation <laughs> yep. after he locked himself in a safe. Oh, but we Jason. have no idea why Tahani. Interesting. Or how Tahani died, sorry. I wouldn't be surprised if they did somehow connect all their deaths. Like a lost kind of thing? Like like they all somehow were in the same area well, when no, they No, not this, necessarily or... the same area, but somehow they were all connected in mm. some way. Like air conditioner was installed by Jason's oh, friend. Oh, Jason's friend. Okay. Or something like that. Yeah. And I'm maybe sure. one of Eleanor's ex-boyfriend's gave jason the safe like we don't know sure yeah yeah, yeah. okay 
I don't know. It just seems like something that they could do. Seems like a a, a nice opportunity. Yeah, sure, a reason that out. Michael put them all together to torture each other. Yeah. Because somehow they're all connected. I don't know. We'll I see. like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I anyway. Think, uh, I think that's the end of our conversation for today. I'm looking forward to next week. Mm-hmm. And yes, if you have any thoughts about the flashbacks, but anything we talked about in any of our episodes, if you disagree with us and you think we're crazy, tell us. It's very likely it's true. If you think that we are right on the money, we are the smartest people ever. It's also tell us very that likely it's true. <laughs> Okay, and we will see you next week. Thanks for sticking with us. Bye. Bye.